Good day. So uh, this is actually a longer talk, and I'll be pulling bits out. Um, uh, I was in. I spent the winter in um, Helsinki visiting uh, my old group there, and so I was coming through London with my kids, and they're visiting museums now with their um, uh, aunts and uncles. Uh, so, but I thought I'd uh, see if I could get a tax write-off. So. Um, uh, not quite, you, you know, I, I also feel the, the urge to sell some of this material. So, um, uh, and, and as it happened, I did find there was a good uh, connection uh, with Balaji up here. So, though we pro I won't be covering that in the, in the, um, in the talk. Um, uh, so, th there's the usual motivation in, in our field, which is information overload, there's way too much, and information warfare. So you don't know, but you're the target of a war right now. Spam, all sorts of things. There's politicians fighting each other with information. Um, and the, the other area is, uh, and this is uh, putting into things into sort of a probabilistic perspective, um, probability vectors. Uh, up until probably about five years ago, we were really very, very limited in the techniques we had to do, well, probably 10 years ago very limited in the techniques we had to deal with probability vectors, even though they were so important. Now, probability, you can have the probability of a part of speech, probability of a, a hashtag, probability of an author for a paper. So there's lots of things you want to put probability vectors on, but we didn't have great machinery for, for working with them, um, especially for doing learning. Uh, one of the areas was in hierarchies. So you can imagine if you're... Um, uh, what's in the chapter should be similar to what's in the whole book. What's in the paragraph should be similar to what's in the chapter. If you've seen neighbouring chapters, it should inform you somehow about what's in the current chapter you're looking at. So, but that kind of sharing is not possible if you were using the standard machinery we used in the 90s, which is the Dirichlet. Um, uh, I'm not going to explain the Dirichlet here. I hope you know it, or if you don't, it's a very simple mathematical distribution on a probability vector. Um, the problem with it is if we put it into a hierarchy, as I've shown here, we end up with uh, sort of a complex formula. The, the, the probabilities occur in different places. And this is actually a pretty complex function. So once you've got these, that's it. You can't do anything. Um, you could do, uh, say, map estimates on the and there's nice recursive map estimates on a tree you could do with this, but the problem is you can't do fast inference on hierarchies with these guys. So um, that was some time ago. Uh, we've got some uh, basically working off uh, the work of Yuai Tei, who sort of really started this area. Um, we've been working for a while and developing a, a new family of methods, which I'll briefly describe but I can't really give it proper justice in, a, in an hour talk. Um, we've got tutorials on it. Um, but this is the punchline, um, which I do want people to, to uh, if you're using some of these things. So Chinese restaurant process is, is a term you hear if you're in machine learning. Um, we don't use these anymore. We, we, you can possibly use them in some other processes, but not with... Uh, not with the Dirichlet processes or pittman yaw processes. If you don't know this stuff, don't matter, but there are probably some of you who may know this, and I'm just trying to target you. Um, the other area is the stick breaking. You see a lot of stick breaking work. Um, in our experience, this interacts very badly with variational techniques, um, uh, shouldn't be done as far as I can see, and the, the, hierarch the standard hierarchical algorithms work very quickly. OK, so that's a punchline. If you know this stuff, I may have reached you. You'd have to read the papers and go through the details to be convinced of this. So, so the other thing I think is, is of interest is uh, everybody's students where we are, they're all talking about deep neural nets and there's fabulous results from that community. Very impressive. Um, and so they've given me tutorial. You should look at this tutorial, Ray. So I read the tutorial. The motivation section is exactly the same as the motivation section for us, for what we're doing with hierarchical non-parametric methods. 
So I realise there's, there's good connections there, and there's, right now there's a bunch of people writing papers trying to link them together. Um, so that's just a, an, an interesting aside. But we view the, the use of probability vector hierarchies as our latent semantic modelling in a way. So this is sort of the overview, really. Um, one other point I'd, I'd like to make uh, um, in this introduction part is what I call old school probabilistic reasoning, which is all about Dirichlet's, really. And during the 90s, early 90s, really, in machine learning, we were busy solving a bunch of standard problems. Decision trees, graphical models, uh, parsing. Um, and this is the sort of formula you get for these things. Now, if you don't, this is LDA. If you don't know this, it probably doesn't matter too much. The key thing is you've, you've passed your graphical model, your decision tree, whatever it is, you end up with formulas that look like this. This is products of normalizers of Dirichlet distributions. And then you do some sampling or some estimation on that. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, um, uh, papers on this. This is what we were, and in, actually in parsing as well. Uh, this is what we were doing in the 90s. Um, but we had to go to quite ridiculous extremes to, to, to deal with some things. Um, so there's all the areas where we were doing this with. And the example I'll show you where this breaks down is from parsing. You probably know, a, I hope you know, a context-free grammar. Um, the idea is each node that you replace, you, you don't consider the context of the replacement. So um, you've got a verb phrase here. You just you ignore the dog when you expand that verb phrase to get the next thing. Why is this a problem? Google bought YouTube. Google bought. What did Google buy? Uh, Google bought a Mars bar. No. You know, you, so you've got a pretty good idea. You're really restricted by context with that. Um, and in fact, the whole natural language processing world has spent since about 98, I think, um, building up ways of dealing with their context to avoid the, the restriction that classical context-free, probabilistic context-free grammars would give you. Um, and I've got very clever ways of doing that. Uh, but this is all happening because we're only using Dirichlet's. Um, so the way we got over this context thing is we did something called Bayesian model averaging, um, which kind of works, but it doesn't really solve the problem. And some guys from here actually, ah, I'll get to that in a minute. But the, the highlight of this probably was in 95 with the context tree weighting algorithm, which is one of those rare... Uh, compression algorithms that has a nice theory as well as a nice implementation. Usually the, the theory and implementation diverge quite significantly. Um, but this is actually a, a, a Bayesian model averaging. So it's similar to what we were doing with uh, decision trees and with uh, graphical models in the early 90s. Though they hadn't seen that. They'd done it independently. Now this was trumped quite significantly with some work that I think a lot of it was done here. Uh, Jan Gusthaus, I don't know how to pronounce these names, and Cedric something, the uh, Arc Jambo. Oh, sorry, it's French. but uh, um, So they were here at the time, I think, I'm not sure. But I met them in Amazon just recently. Mm -hmm. um, and th this beat CTW substantially, but there's no Bayesian model averaging. What it is, is a better prior, and it's a context-sensitive prior. So you've really under you use the context to, to give you a prior for where to go next. So Google bought Yahoo, you can model, you know, the Google bought, you can really model what's going to be in the, the verb following bought, in the noun, fra the noun phrase following bought. You can model the context of that using these techniques. Um, so this was, a, I think, a major advance, and it all comes from uh, EY's um, hierarchical Pittman your models in the 2006. I ran into this in about 2010 because I had some students who were interested in it. Um, I wasn't doing much at the time. I, I was having, I, basically I wasn't doing research. But, uh, so I helped them with a bit of the math. Um, uh, so anyway, you know, there's a whole new range of possibilities here. Let's, let's move on. Um, now, I'm going to briefly go through what we're doing with, with these models. Um, I won't uh, 
Um, it's a flying talk, so I'll just try and give you a flavour for it. You know, I, there's only so much I can do. Short space of time. Um, I've got an extended tutorial I'll be giving at uh, Machine Learning Summer School in about a month. Um, so th there is better material online, but, but hopefully this will give you some idea of, of what it is we're doing. And um, This comes from Dirichlet process and the pittman your process. Uh, you know, there's this fancy word process there that is uh, partly, I think, statisticians put that word in to scare us. And it, it's not, it doesn't really mean anything. It just means that the, the items we're looking at have been indexed. That's all it means. Um, but the thing to notice is that if you've got a, a Dirichlet process on a finite distribution, it's just a Dirichlet. So a Dirichlet process is a Dirichlet that you extend to more complex spaces. That, that's all it is. Pitman your process is a bit more complex, but you, to a degree it's just like a Dirichlet. It's a distribution on a probability vector. Um, the idea is two model context. We want to have a probability vector on what goes here knowing he taught A. So what probability vector on the words that can go here knowing the, the three word context before? The way we're going to set that up hierarchically is say we'll drop the, the last word and we'll say the mean of this probability vector is this one. And that's the key idea that UIT introduced. For me, this is, you know, this is absolutely brilliant. This is one of the, the I think, one of the most important steps um, in machine learning uh, in recent times. Um, and you get a nice hierarchy over your probability vectors where you gradually introduce more and more context. Um, and there's a lovely way of doing inference here. Uh, things got a bit crazy in machine learning for a while. You just have to put a Chinese restaurant in your paper and an automatic entrance into NIPS, you know, that was sort of... Um, uh, but, and there was all sorts of crazy ideas, you know, the multi-floor Chinese restaurant process. God knows. Um, some of these are pretty complex, but what we've done is, as far as I can tell, I can still, I cannot see a reason to use a Chinese restaurant anymore. As, uh, for this, there are other Chinese restaurants that you'd use for other processes. I can't see a reason to use it for pit manure anymore. Um, I'll tell you very briefly, I'll try and give you an idea of what we're doing. Um, so the first step is you've got a hierarchy, and here's a very simple one, a parent probability vector theta, the probability vector you're interested in, P, and your data. And what to do with efficient inference, you've got to integrate out the parameters and somehow deal with it that way. So when we integrate out P, if we get it, do it with a Dirichlet, I showed you the formula before, it's a mess. What we'd like is something like this. So we, if Think of Bayes' gra graphical model inference. We'd like to pass a message up to the parent that's just a multinomial. That's what we'd like. That would be the perfect, simple message to pass, if we could do that. Um, uh, the simplest possible message, things would be fine, and the whole thing could work in a nice hierarchy. That's the ideal. Well, the thing is, this can't be the data. Data counts in, it's got to be something else. So therefore, it's a latent variable. Therefore, we've got to extend things a little bit. We've got to call T a latent variable, introduce it, and now it's on the left-hand side of the probability side. Having done that, that's our general formula. Now, this is something called a species sampler, if you go to the statistical literature. There's a long history of this. And Pittman, uh, Pittman was one of the key guys. He's a statistician at Berkeley, who incidentally comes from Canberra. Um, where I was when I was doing this. Um, uh, this is the sort of formula we have. The idea is that T is, is, is a, the counts that you're passing up to the parent. And you're not going to pass up all of the counts in. You're just going to pass up some of them. And how you do that is the magic of the whole thing that makes it work. Um, now, in Yiwai's papers, uh, he gives this formula, basically. Um, the mul there's something called the multinomial Dirichlet, which is a combination of the multinomial distribution and the Dirichlet distribution. We can also have a multinomial pit manure, and it looks like this. There is our simple multinomial likelihood we're passing up to the parent. 
Everything else is a function of n and t. So this is that form I was telling you about. Um, to compare the two, the top one is what we do in standard with Dirichlet hierarchies, if it's Dirichlet. This one is when we do our add in our Pitman Miller. Um, showing this and explaining this, that's probably, you know, it's probably about 20 minutes in there. It's not, but we won't do it. Um, uh, UI had, had this in one of his pay, in his early tech report from 2006. Um, where he got the connections, he might have got Lancelot James to help him, I'm not sure. But uh, all of these formulas, they're all buried in one of Pittman's reports. You know, I think we had a, re a review back once. This formula is equation 286 on page 517 of a, of a, pay, of a report at some you know, institute in France. You know. and so you know all of these things are buried in, in mathematicians' work, but it's getting them out at the time that's the problem. Um, and some of the statisticians have been helping us do that. But, but this was in UI's paper, and he basically says, well, this is a combinatoric function. So we can't deal with it. Oh, we won't do this. We'll do something else. We'll do Chinese restaurants. Um, some of us, and there's quite a few people, including Jan Gusthaus, uh, who was here, and a few others, uh, Dim Fung, who's a, 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 a one of the lecturers at uh, Deakin in, in Melbourne. There's quite a few who've done it. They've done this. They figured out they can tabulate this quite easy. We've got a whole lot of software for it. And therefore, you can work with these formulas. But that doesn't solve the problem, actually. Um, uh, just to sh give you an intuition what's happening to your Chinese restaurants, if you know Chinese restaurants, if you don't, sorry, I'm going to you just you know, shut your eyes for a minute. So uh, I can't, you, you know, there's, there's a lot of background here. This is a Chinese restaurant, and the colors are the same data type. The problem with Chinese restaurants is that you split the guys that are the same data type across different tables. And that introduces a problem because in, if you've got a lot of tables, you need dynamic memory to, to keep track of everything. That's why the algorithms fail. You need dynamic memory. Um, now, what we do in our case is we keep all the, the same type at the table. But what we do, what we do is just keep the... We say, well, there are two tables. And these, this was the head of the table here, and that's the head of the table here. So that's the difference. Ours is a collapsed version of theirs, strictly speaking. Therefore, by standard theorems, it's a better algorithm, if, if the inference is pretty fast. Um, but if you've done it right. Now, the problem with this is, if, if you set this up, and I'll show you how we... This is where you've got a simple hierarchy and down the bottom you've got your multinomials, this is your data. What we're going to do, and I'll flip through these slides, is gradually apply this multinomial pitman yaw to integrate out each probability vector in turn until we've got none left. And we'll just gradually work up the hierarchy. This is what we're applying. We're, we're going to get rid of our probability vector and put this there. So we'll gradually work the way up. We've, we've done it at the bottom nodes, done it at the middle nodes, done it at the top nodes. And so th the, the original posterior has been turned into this. Um, and when you expand out and put in those, those functions, you're all our sterling numbers and various things. And you can try sampling on this. The problem is it's not going to work as well as a Chinese restaurant. And the reason is it's not mixing. So if you go and sample just the, the T's at that corner there, you're not seeing what's going to change at the parent node. For fast mixing, when you change a, a, a data type down here, you want to look, sort of propagate the change and see what happens over the entire network. If I change this, the... the the class of this, uh, the cluster that this data is in, or if I change the topic or something, I want to look at the, the instantaneous change that's going to have on the entire network. That's how you get fast mixing. And that's, to a degree, that's what the current Chinese restaurant process does, the hierarchical, because you pull out and put back in an entire hierarchy. So we wanted to mimic that procedure. 
Um, I'll come back to this. So we do it with something called table indicators. What we do is, here's our data. For every data point, there's now a Boolean that tells us how far the data goes up in the hierarchy. Um, and so those counts and the latent variables you introduce, the counts are just the, the number of data that's of that particular type, the case type. T, which is the latent variables, it's, it's now going to be only if the Boolean is on does it, do we add a count into the T. Um, basically what I'm doing is I'm, and the next slide shows it here, The top is, is the standard multinomial Dirichlet, which retains an ordering. What we're going to do is unorder the data, remove the ordering. If you remove the ordering of a multinomial, you take out the choose term. That's what we're doing here. We're removing the ordering. We have to back out the choose term. It's just that you can't, the, the choose term doesn't appear here because it's, a, it's been integrated out somehow to get the current form. But if we back out the choose term, then we get something that is a distribution on the Boolean rather than a distribution on the whole count. And now we can sample the Boolean in the same way as the um, pitman yaw So this is basically what we're doing here. So now we're going to sample this Boolean at the same time as this. If there's a hierarchy, we sample up the hierarchy. It looks a bit complicated, but here we've got a hierarchy. Here's a probability vector. We have to have a Boolean for every node to say how far up the data goes. And then the counts at the different nodes are, are computed from these. It looks a bit complex, but that's effectively what we're doing inside our algorithm. And it is directly a collapsed version of a standard Chinese restaurant process. Now we'll come back to this. The gr now this is convergence on a... Um, uh, on an n-gram problem. So you can take, say, uh, a gigabyte of text, uh, you can build a, like a 10-gram model for it, um, and then you can run it and see how it converges. Uh, the, the purple one, the bottom one, the pink one, that's if we're using the original, now this is, this is um, a simple n-gram, so if you, we're using this form here, and we're sampling here, we get the pink one. There it is. So it's very fast, converges in a network, converges to the level of noise. The Chinese restaurant process is the green one. It takes a long time. The blue one is this Booleanized version of ours. So it's not quite as fast on the n-gram problem, but if we put it in topic models or clustering, then it's better. Because when we use topic models or clustering, the Chinese restaurant process is the same as the pink one here, as the, the, the non-Boolean version. But when we're doing, um, uh, and the blue one, which is this using the table indicators, which is this version here, when we do this, we get um, in the case of the hierarchical case, it now works really well. Um, so that's my explanation of, of, of how that works. Um, yes? If you use the Boolean representation, can you also sample the hyperparameters? Uh, yeah, exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a bit more, actually, the concentration is a bit more complex. Okay. But no, the real complex one is the discount one. Because the Sterling number tables are a function of the discount. So if you change the discount in the, uh, the Chinese restaurant one, it's actually a simple function and you can sample directly. But for, the, for our case, you're now going to have to regenerate the tables. Yeah. So that's a potential problem. And that, in fact, is the only reason why um, the curves look like this because I'm sampling. If I wasn't sampling, mine would drop down to here like this. So if I don't sample, boom, they're, they're, they've settled, they're, they've got it. Uh, whereas Chinese restaurant takes quite a while. But because I'm, all the effort here is in the 
sampling the hyperparameter. That's the big impact. Um, uh, and sampling the hyperparameters is really important. It is, re in topic models, huge difference. There are papers that people, where you, you know, they just, oh, we've set the hyperparameter to such and such. Be suspicious. That's, you know, because we can change the hyperparameters and get a massive improvement in, in terms of things. So there's a, there's a number of papers, places like Palmy and uh, JMLR, that I probably wouldn't, I would have knocked back because they didn't do a proper job of that. Um, but in general, um, uh, 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 sorry, I'm getting ahead here. In, in, in general, um, I don't think people really understood the roles of these things. Let me show you the key slide. This is the expected number of open tables given the data. So if you've got a thousand data points, as you change your concentration parameter, you can have more or less tables. Um, so people are saying they've only got one, you know, they're using the minimum path assumption, which is only one table. They're not even on the map here, because that's down there. Um, uh, but you can see the, depending on what you set the concentration parameter, you've pretty much got a good idea of how many tables are open. So it is very important uh, to do a proper job of that, and it takes a while. That's why it's it, it really slows things down. Um, so now let's look at our, uh, I'm going to skip, skip the discrete feature vectors. Some really nice stuff I got from, um, this is part of a tutorial I got from uh, Lancelot James. So he's generalised the Indian buffet process um, and we've been looking at hierarchical versions of it to try and understand it. But, uh, um, So let's look at topic models. Now this is the the, um, the stuff I was advertising in the in the, uh, uh, in, the in the abstract. Um, so just to remind you, a topic model is a linear model. Uh, in the image world, we're, we're making a, a linear combination of these components, and we're trying to get an image. This comes from the Cambridge Cambridge Face database. Uh, this particular set. Um, in the text world, we've got semantically coherent word sets, and we're trying to combine them to get a bag of words. So you can see it's the same thing. Um, and depending on how we set up our, our error function and our type of data, non-negative, whatever, we get different ways of doing this. Topic modelling is this line here. There's lots of other ways of doing it. Um, the non-negative matrix factorization is great, uh, by the way. Um, now, just as a, an aside, why should you care about topic models, and why should I care about topic models? Um, well, it, 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 to a degree, it's sort of an esoteric part of machine learning, where people are all sort of fighting each other to get the best topic model, and uh, but. Probably more interesting is how you use them. Um, first off, they do have a really nice, they come out with a really nice semantics. So, uh, for instance, we can put in about 700 do documents, news documents on a coherent theme, and we'll come out with, say, 50 really nice, coherent, clear topics out of it. It's very seductive. These are some topics, I think I built 2,000 topics off a, a bit of a news article using our standard code. Um, so it's 20 years of news. Here is the, um, the anthrax scare. You may be too young to remember that, but uh, old people like me can. Um, Senator Dashley received a little packet with anthrax spores in it, you know, and it was, it was over the news for a while, but there, there it appears. So these things are highly refined. They're, they really go down into detail. Um, it's just amazing, what, and you know, run it on the NIPS and the NIPS content, it's really good fun. You, you'll rarely see this kind of fidelity published in the, most people stop at 100, a lot of the, a lot of the algorithms and papers. Um, 
but you can really go down to extreme levels. Uh, now, but that's sort of the seductive thing. We like to combine that with parsing. Um, but another area is, and this is in document segmentation, th this is currently the best performing document segmentation system uh, built by um, uh, Landu and Mark Johnson at Macquarie. He's a, he was a Brown, he's a language guy. Um, and lo and behold, what's in the middle of the topic model? Now, you wouldn't tell from the algorithm, but model wise. You know, the algorithm you build is, is different. So this is, they don't have a topic model subroutine, but there's, the model is there, and that's used to drive the whole document segmentation. This works very well. Um, so uh, in terms of evaluating topic models, I had David Lewis visiting us recently. He's an old machine learning guy, uh, comes from an IR background. Um, I met him at uh, AT&T many years ago. And we're having dinner, uh, lunch, and uh, oh, topic models. God, they're crazy. Uh, you know, it's just like a Rorschach, uh, uh, I can't pronounce it, a Rorschach inkblot test. You stare at them, one of them long enough, you can see anything. Stare at a bunch of words long enough, you can see anything. Um, well, uh, so, we do have reasonable ways of evaluating them. Probably the most important is PMI, which is it measures the coherence of the word sets. Uh, and so a number of groups have done this, um, uh, both in the US. I, I know the work of Tim, Tim Baldwin's group. He's in uh, uh, Melbourne, so I know their work. Um, uh, the other way is, is perplexity, which is... Um, you know, it's a good measure. It's, it's hard to argue it's useful for anything. But, you know, you could put clustering, the ability to use topic models for clustering, but it's a bit of an indirect task. And, in fact, the best clustering algorithms seem to start with NMF, which is a version of topic modelling, and then add them as features and then do clustering. So, um, in, Anyway, the, for good or for bad, these are the measures we're, we're working with. And they're pretty well established uh, in the community. But I will say, um, in doing our evaluations, I have to do about uh, five different variations of perplexity calculation because every paper had a different variation. So, yeah, it was a real issue. Um, I spent a lot of time coding this stuff. Uh, we looked at a number of papers um, uh, and we spend a bit of time communicating with the authors, finding out the details of how they did stuff. Some of them were very clear. So, you know, Sato's work and, and uh, uh, Balaji's work here, you know, this was good stuff and I could see what they were doing. And, um, <clears throat> but one of the things we, we were, part of the reason we were doing this is that we wanted to test out this idea of... Uh, Blestiness. It comes from a paper by Doyle and Elkin. Now, they had in there a... Um, so they've got a variational algorithm for what is a hierarchical Dirichlet. So I'm thinking, oh, it can't work. Boy, there's a chance for us. And then I looked at what they had and it just seemed like a crazy idea. Um, it just seemed completely nutty. And then about a month later, I, I woke up one morning and, my God, they're brilliant. You know? And I realised how I can implement it. So a couple of days later, I had the implementation basically working and I saw how good it was. Um, but here's the idea of burstiness. If you look at that text, this is a small segment from a news article. What's interesting is, well, the stop words appear a few times, but cabinet appears twice. Just a small bit of text, the word appears twice. This is typical of news because it's not random content. It's content about a given topic. Well, the author will tend to use the same word multiple times if they want to refer to the same thing. So words appear multiple times in documents. So you've got to model that. In fact, that's what species samplers were invented for in the statistical community. And there's a whole statistical machinery for doing this. That's partly what got the statisticians, Pittman and so forth, going in this area. Um, actually, more interesting... It's actually related to the IR theory. So uh, there's a guy, um, Purilla, uh, I forget his first name, it's one of these Finnish names, um, 
and uh, Peter Sunahag, they'd shown that the, the two Poisson model sort of is related to the uh, pittman yaw model um, and the original BM25 model we use for IR was actually derived from a two Poisson model that is very similar in structure to a, to a pittman yaw model. So there's sort of interesting relationships there. They also uh, use burstiness in IR. Anyway, so let's, um, uh, let's look at what we're doing with our model. Now, so here's the original LDA graph. Sorry if you don't read graphical models. Um, but boxes indicate a vector. So this is a matrix here. This is a data matrix. We've got a, a matrix of topics. Up here, the theta, that's a matrix of component vectors. We're going to dot the component vector with the topic vector to give us a mean for what these word vectors look like. That's the original LDA. Now, when we're building our models, we might have a million parameters in here. Now, just from basic statistics, if we've got a million parameters, we should probably have thousands of hyperparameters. Just common sense. Standard LDA, you've got one. See, we know there's a problem there, right? And in 2009, uh, Hannah Wallach and David Mimno did a paper about rethinking LDA, which was basically on this topic. Well, we should add some more parameters, was their conclusion. They used fairly simple machinery, so they didn't quite get it right. But the idea was there and it was correct. Very well-cited paper. Um, by the way, this is the first ever implementation of non-parametric LDA. Done in 2007 actually, published in 2008, beats everyone, beats all the code published since, using variational all sorts of weird and wonderful algorithms. This is the best. It is truncated version of non-parametric. Um, so this is the problem as it was set up in the, in the original paper by Mike Jordan, Michael Jordan, uh, UI Tay and others. And they called it hierarchical Dirichlet process LDA, it became known as. Um, we go and make the other side non-parametric as well. So to give you an idea what this is doing. Uh, suppose you've, you don't have a whole lot of data on Russia. Just maybe a couple of a hundred documents or so. So maybe you can't put in too many topics on Russia. Well, um, if you had more data, you may break them up into, you know, Crimea and Moscow and Siberia. But if you don't have too much data, you'll just leave it alone. And any one article may just use a subset of the words that you've got there. Um, actually, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, that's a description of the next slide. This effectively is the background distribution. Effectively, what it gets is the, is the they're like stop words, but they're, they're content words that are non-topical. Um, this is the, the Russian example. So what the burstiness thing that Elkin and Doyle did, so we may have a Russian topic here, but we're going to allow it to be specialised in the document to maybe Crimea or Moscow. So each document can have a specialisation of the topic in it. Think about what that means. A million parameters here, a hundred words. You're going to have a million parameters to fit your a hundred words here. That's why I thought it was crazy. You do. A million parameters to fit a hundred words. So that means maybe you've got a hundred times more parameters in your model than you have data points. Clearly crazy. But it works if you integrate, if you integrate out these, pr these <coughs> probability vectors. And in our technique, everything's integrated out and you get left with a bunch of booleans here to say where the data goes. Um, so we can implement this, whereas the variational algorithm couldn't do more than about 300 documents. For us, it's about twice as slow as regular LDA um, and uses about double the memory. So with not too much of a penalty, this works. Um, here, are the, this is a pitman your hierarchy, here and here. Uh, so this is what we're using our fancy algorithms for. These are the uh, 
um, hyperparameters we're sampling, usually with a... I, I, I used slide sampling originally, but it struggled sometimes. Um, and I ended up using uh, um, Molly Giltz's code, some of you may know, the adaptive projection sampling. I've only ever found one error in the code. And it was, it's in C, so it's a bit hard to use, but uh, the one error was in the error handling. It's, it's amazing code. We tried to get some of the re rewrite it. And too complex. Um, what we have is a concentration parameter per topic. And what happens is, if this concentration, it's a variance parameter. If the variance goes, goes high, it switches the topic off. It's unused. High variance doesn't do anything. If the variance is low, the topic is, rem, remains quite specialised and it, it's used quite precisely. So we're, it's a lovely um, thing to have. But remember, we've got maybe a, a billion data points and, and, and millions of parameters. We can easily add lots of hyperparameters. So um, uh, the other thing is these counts, in, prin in principle, this is a tensor for each document, for each topic, for each word. Can't store it. Impossible. But we just recompute it as we need for each um, when we come to the document from the booleans. Um, I'll just give you an example of the performance uh, with our two measures. Um, uh, this is done in Nuplot, and I wasn't too good with the colours at the time. But uh, so the top is the perplexity, and lower is better. The bottom, the two good ones, uh, that's with burstiness. The two top ones are without burstiness. The, the uh, let me, uh, what I need is a pointer, but, um, so this is regular LDA with burstiness. It, it bottoms out pretty much. It, it always finds less topics. When we use our fully non-parametric LDA, we always get more topics and a significant improvement. Um, uh, this is the, the coherence of the word sets. Burstiness is drops in each case quite significantly. Uh, oh, increases. So what burstiness does is it um, improves the PMI. Um, we did a lot of comparisons. I'm not going to go through them all. They're in the papers, but uh, here's a comparison against uh, what I thought was the best variational algorithm from SATO 2012 or 13. It's a KDD paper. It's the red one. Uh, orange is Mallet run in its uh, HDP version. Um, blue is our implementation of uh, uh, HDP LDA, and green is our fully non-parametric one. This is without burstiness, by the way. If we use burstiness, we beat everyone on all metrics. It's unfair. Basically, everyone gets blown away. Um, but without burstiness, we, we still beat them. And that's purely because a better sampling algorithm. Um, I'll, this, is, this is actually the figures taken from uh, Balaji's paper. Um, so what they showed was that their uh, use of the uh, Indian buffet process really gave them a huge improvement over HDP LDA. Very impressive. Um, now, our implementation of HDP LDA, though, is about the same as theirs with the, um, uh, with the IBP. But, you know, that's because we're using a different sampling algorithm. So my bet is if we introduced their techniques into ours, we'd improve a whole lot more. So um, we're using a much better sampling algorithm for part of it, uh, but, but what they've got with this IBP, it's a beautiful, simple thing you add in. The, the theory is really elegant, um, and it leads to ni a quite a nice sampler. So um, I thought this was amazing, and there's certain things we like to do with it. Um, so I'll be... Uh, that's why I've been trying to bug you, because I want to see, see how this works. Um, uh, but I will point out, this is the best I've seen. I've seen no other of the non-parametric LDA stuff even come close to this, other than ours. So it is, it's very impressive work. Um, so uh, 
the code uh, for ours is, I've had it out for a while, um, it's multi-core, it runs eight core. Over eight core, because we're using locking, doesn't work too well. Um, uh, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, results on the, the topic model using this technique, the um, uh, block indicator samplers. Um, we, I think we do a reasonable job of explaining it in the KDD paper last year. So, and the tutorials we're trying to improve on it. Um, I'll just, ex just show you some of the other, what I believe is fun stuff we've been doing with this. Um, here's a, a uh, so in Twitter, uh, people have sentiment dictionaries. What you'd like to do is specialise that sentiment dictionary. You'd like sentiment words on mobile phones, sentiment words on game consoles. But where do we get them from? Well, we can learn them in a semi-supervised way using the, uh, the, so here are the emoticons of a tweet. Um, we've done some language processing and we've got the, the nouns and here we've got the adjectives. Uh, but what we're doing is we're taking a sentiment dictionary, adding some parameters to turning it into probability vectors and then we're specialising that sentiment probability distribution for each area, phones, uh, computers, laptops. Uh, works reasonably well. Um, I'll show you another. Oh, this is the segmentation task which I was referring to earlier. Document segmentation is trying to get the meaningful chunks. Um, I'll just show you the, uh, it's actually a pretty complex sampler. But this is an example of, this is one of the previous better algorithms in green. So what you do is you try and figure out where you're going to cut the, the document up. Um, and the ground truth in this case is the red marks. Our blue is indicating where we, we're estimating where to put the brakes. Um, this is one of the previous algorithms. So we're a lot more specialised. We seem to be doing better. Um, there's a pretty extensive uh, uh, background and uh, very finely done uh, metrics we've got for this. Uh, it's quite, uh, we're just following a lot of previous work um, on that. This is a more recent thing we've been doing with bibliographies. Um, so we've got the topics, we've got the authors. We're trying to figure out who are the important authors, what topics are they inter interested in. And if I put the parameters down low enough and, and drop the thresholds, I can actually get myself to appear on this uh, slide. But um, uh, in general, you know, you've got all of the, uh, William Cohen, Neil Friedman, I don't know if you, he's not so much in machines now a bioinformatics guy, but uh, very big in machine learning, uh, Zubin, Garamani, Tom Beek. So, you know, all of the guys appear there and you've got a, a, a nice um, web there. That's another thing we're doing with these um, uh, networks. So that's about it. Um, uh, the tutorial I'm referring to, we can try and read up on the methods. We haven't published the definitive journal article yet. Is at the, uh, the, the website there. So, okay, thank you. We'll call it quits. Oh uh, yeah. Um, uh. So you, you said that you know this, uh, you know this is all kind of cool, but what, what are those kind of deep networks and what is the kind of performance that they're getting on these kinds of problems? Is there any kind of comparison? Um, people have done deep neural topic models. Yeah. Uh, they seem to perform really well. So um, I, I haven't seen a comparison that I'd be sure of, but I'd be completely unsurprised if they're current best. Wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. Because in, in many domains, they are current best. And it's because they're bringing in a lot of external knowledge. Um, usually, they train on a whole lot of other data and then they apply to the, the task at hand. So, um, uh, so yeah, that's, a, th that's an issue and it's, it's um, there's a different range of techniques there. It's more sort of recursive uh, uh, 
logistic regression or something or other. So it would be interesting to see how are these things combined or, or possibly. Um, I'd like to see some people do the, uh, the plain old language model, you know, the n-gram thing. I think that's a good one because it's a good test case. And doing a deep, a deep version. Yeah, 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 and see what happens there. Um, can it handle the... Uh, the um, but th I, I know there's other areas where um, it's a fairly restricted set of techniques and, you know, it can't handle the range of things that some of the non-parametrics can do, but we, we have to see what the, what the outcome is. But certainly there's a need to, to look at them both. That's how I'd see it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, hmm. uh, the, the issue there is I know some people have trouble reproducing the results. But we know they've got good results because they take the system that's trained and they can test it and see that it works. So we know there's no sort of no bad science there. But we do know sometimes it, it's hard quite, yeah, it's hard to get, yeah, yeah. So, um, mm. that's definitely a, a, an area for, for future study, I'd say. So, yeah. Good eye. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you.